begin by uh, thanking uh, Jim and the other organizers uh, for kindly uh, inviting me here uh, to present some of the work we've been doing at Los Alamos. Uh, and in particular, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the, the real people who have driven this work. Uh, and they are actually in the audience today. Uh, so it's Nick Wakeham and Young Kang Lu, uh, two very talented postdocs in our group. Uh, that have been doing uh, the, the various uh, work that I'll present. Um, we're also fortunate to be collaborating uh, with a large number of people at Los Alamos. Um, and so we have Temple Burroughs, Ramon Mir, Eric Bauer, uh, Ross McDonald, uh, Vivian Zapp at the Magnet Lab. Young Q Wang has been doing some of the iron damage uh, work uh, that we have. Madame Le Pain uh, is uh, now doing uh, angle result photo mission with us. Uh, and Nina Weiss-Bernstein uh, has been helping with the uh, fabrication. Uh, in addition to this, uh, I'd like to thank also our uh, external collaborators uh, who have provided uh, not only just uh, samples, um, but also support uh, and inspiration for the work that I'll tell you about today. Okay, so the outline, uh, as well as the uh, sort of conclusions of this talk, uh, so I'll have sort of four separate topics that I'll actually try and cover today. Uh, one, uh, we'll talk about our thermoelectric measurements, uh, which reveal actually a fairly heavy uh, surface state uh, in, in this material. Uh, and this is the work uh, by uh, Yong Kang. Uh, subsequent to that, we'll talk about the uh, ion damage work on also samarium hexaboride, uh, which seems to reveal that we get an amorphous conducting layer uh, as a consequence of the ion damage. Uh, and we can interpret the data uh, in the sense of it is, the surface state is reconstructing uh, below uh, the initial um, uh, ion damaged uh, layer that we create. Um, then I'd like to spend just a little bit of time also asking about sort of what the status is as far as actually predicting the topology of strongly correlated materials. Um, I think uh, we've already heard the debate uh, as to whether or not there's an intrinsic topological state uh, in samarium hexaboride, uh, I think the lack of additional materials uh, is actually perhaps a signature uh, that we need to ask whether or not we actually have the, the tools to correctly predict topology. Uh, and finally, if there's time, uh, I know niobium marcinide is not topological, uh, is not strongly correlated, uh, but is a topological material. Uh, I'd like to present uh, some of our recent work. Uh, where we've been looking at quantum oscillation studies, uh, in particular the Shubnikov to Haas studies uh, on niobium arsenide, uh, where we see both evidence for a trivial and a non trivial topic. Okay, so the samarium hexaboride work. Um, is so uh, we took a single crystal, uh, used x ray diffraction to determine which faces we were looking at, uh, then polished the sample down. Uh, to look at just the 110 uh, plane, and so we're doing transport uh, in the uh, 110 plane uh, of these crystals. Um, so we have two channel conductivity, so this is uh, sort of as, as many people have been interpreted this, this data. Uh, the, the high temperature data can be fit uh, by an activated uh, behavior, uh, so for that, uh, you can see we get sort of the, the typical hybridization gap of, board, of order 40 Kelvin. And then at low temperatures, uh, we have uh, sort of this metallic-like behavior. Uh, and from this, if we assume that it's a surface state, uh, we extract a, a surface conductivity, as, as shown here, actually, uh, sort of a fairly uh, large surface conductivity, uh, as well as a uh, sort of very uh, low mobility uh, for this surface state. So when we're doing thermal power measurements, uh, what we're doing is putting a temperature gradient across the sample. Uh, and then because uh, the thermal gradient pushes uh, phonons uh, as well as electrons, because electrons carry charge. Uh, so as you're pushing electrons across the sample, that also sets up the voltage. The longitudinal response of the, the system is the thermal power. Uh, and then if you apply a magnetic field, uh, analogous to the Hall effect, uh, the electrons can also generate a transverse voltage, uh, and that's then measuring the inertia uh, effect. So we can analyze the data uh, in terms of just using the sort of Boltzmann-Mach formulation. Uh, and importantly, 
uh, these uh, thermoelectric quantities give you access to the energy derivative of the conductivity. Uh, and so if you can just sort of think about your, your conductivity being expressed as some sort of uh, power law uh, of the energy, uh, then in fact what you get is you get access uh, to this, this power law uh, by doing these measurements. So we're going to be focusing on the low temperature limit, so that in the thermal power, uh, as well as the NERSS coefficient, the T linear, uh, and gives us access to not only this coefficient, uh, but also a value of what the Fermi energy is. Uh, we'll be looking in the low field limit, uh, and even though I, I don't show the data, uh, our data I have to like to show you, um, but it's linear uh, up to about 9 tesla over all the temperature ranges that we look at. Uh, so uh, we're confident uh, that we're working with the low field limit uh, for these, these systems. Okay, so here's the data. Uh, so thermal power now presented as a function of inverse temperature. Uh, so low temperatures over here are now on the right. Um, so you see over the entire sort of temperature range, or the majority of the temperature range, uh, we have negative thermal power. So uh, this is similar to dominantly electron. Uh, contribution to the transport. Um, and then this sort of intrinsic semiconducting like behavior at high temperature uh, gives way at the lowest temperatures uh, sort of to a T linear behavior. And you see that much better in the inset here, where it's just now thermal power as a function of temperature. Uh, the value of the slope, uh, the very large value of the slope, immediately tells you actually that the Fermi energy is small uh, in this material. Um, Furthermore, we can analyze the, uh, the, the NERPS data, which is uh, shown here um, uh, in, in the pink curve. Uh, at higher temperatures, in fact, uh, the, the power law uh, can be described in terms of uh, non-degenerate uh, sort of semiconducting behavior, uh, a condo scattering uh, with a scattering rate uh, that is given uh, by this sort of minus uh, uh, scattering rate of 1.7. Um, importantly, we don't see any quantum oscillations in the data that we've looked at. Uh, so often thermal power and uh, uh, inerts measurements can be very sensitive when the carrier density is very low. Uh, we don't see any evidence for that, um, but that's also sort of consistent with the low mobility uh, that we have in these samples. What magnitude of the uh, So just measured the 9 tesla. Most of the samples, that's loud. Right, but so often when, so so I agree, so for electrical conductivity, it should have across the Haas, but so we might expect that you would actually see an onset even at lower, lower. Yeah, but, but no, that, yeah. fair enough, but the, the observation, we don't see anything up to nine, you can read into that whether you think that's significant or not. Um, okay, so, so now I'd like to focus on this metallic behavior uh, at the lower temperatures. Uh, and so as I was mentioning, uh, so we'd like to determine the, the Fermi energy. Uh, if we take the assumption uh, that the surface state uh, is a Dirac-like state, uh, then we can express what the conductivity is in terms of some scattering rate uh, to some power lambda. And so now our thermal power, the T linear behavior, uh, can be expressed in terms of the scattering rate divided by the, the Fermi energy. And the NERDS data uh, also has the scattering rate divided by the Fermi energy, but also has the uh, mobility of the sample. Since we measure the electrical conductivity as well, we also have the Hall mobility, so dividing that out gives us the ratio. So now we have two quantities which we measure here in the low temperature limit, both of them T linear, uh, and two unknowns. And so because of that, we can actually extract what we get here. And so you can see that we get something which is of order half a milli electron volt for the Fermi energy in the system. So a very small Fermi energy. In addition to that, we get a T linear scattering rate. Uh, and so this is consistent actually with uh, what's been seen in angular result photo mission, uh, where they've uh, estimated what the, uh, the scattering rate is, uh, and they also find a uh, sort of linear uh, dependence uh, of the scattering rate. So if you take this very small um, Fermi energy, uh, then because the Fermi surface is so small, uh, you actually end up with incredibly large effective masses. Uh, if we use the value that we have for our carrier density, actually, you get an incredibly large uh, effective mass uh, for our surface state. Um, 
If you don't like that value and you say, no, I'd rather uh, take the value from uh, photo emission uh, or some other studies, uh, then you get a, uh, a smaller uh, Fermi surface. Um, but still, uh, even with this size Fermi surface, you still get very large effects of mass. So I would argue that the thermal power data alone uh, are revealing that we have an effective mass uh, order 100 uh, bare electron masses. Question? Yes. If this is all consistent, <coughs> have you measured the specific heat capacity of the sample? We have, yes. And how does it, how does it, how does the gamma compare with the mass you're seeing, assuming one or two surface layers? So we don't, we haven't figured out how to interpret the specific heat data. So the specific heat data has uh, a, a peak uh, at some finite temperature. Uh, so it is true that you'll get a if you just sort of extrapolate uh, sort of below one Kelvin uh, to a finite gamma, you get sort of like 10 milliliters. So you get a sort of actually significant value. I don't know uh, if that matches uh, with this effective mass and the size of the Fermi surface. We haven't. And does anyone know whether that linear part scales with the volume or scales? We've tried that. So we've tried to powder up the sample and look as a function of powdering. Uh, those measurements have been inconclusive so far, mainly because you get sort of uh, it's, it's a difficult measurement. You end up with sort of thermal, thermally decoupling your grains uh, as you powder the sample, and so getting reliable, reliable estimates at low temperatures of the powdered samples uh, is proving to be difficult. Uh, but it, there doesn't seem to be any big change uh, that we've seen. So. So, but I think, you know, so independence of just looking at the thermal power, the, the large value of the thermal power at, at low temperatures, I mean, you can argue about maybe we're off by a factor of two, depending on what the sort of the, the exponent you'd like to take for your scattering rate. Um, but that alone will already tell you that the, the Fermi energy is small. But you also get the TFL of 100. So, TFL is relatively good. So, so the, the KFL, yeah, so uh, is the, we were extracting the mean free path uh, just from the, the KF from the, uh, the carrier concentration uh, as well as the, the mobility of the, the surface state that we inferred from the, from the hull. So, so in fact, actually, this, the, the KFL is just actually not from the nurse. Uh, in this case, I think Yong Kang will correct me if I, if I misspeak. But. The mean free path. Right, so, you, so the, the, the nerves in the, in the semiconducting regime, then, the, the nerves that we would expect the from, from the thermal power, right? Uh, right. This, this is something. So we should not, it, in the semiconducting regime, should not be too many. So, so the other thing I, I want, right? I, I like the fact that the power shows almost full range of interest in this electron, right? How to qualify this? Qualify the same range electrolyte? Yes. Same temperature of the electron, or there's no swing in all that electron in the same temperature range. Um, or it's, it's yeah. Right. 
So, um, so I can't see here if this is crossing, but I'm, my recollection is electron level of the entire range. I would say, do you understand why? Well, so, so, so you can get this dip even just in this, this two band model, uh, sort of the, the two band fitting. So, right, so, so you have a bulk contribution, uh, which is just activated. Uh, and then a, a surface state contribution, which is has a uh, sort of constant term plus a temperature dependent, some sort of uh, inelastic scattering, uh, as you can see from some finer temperature dependence. Right. So I think uh, you know this is related, uh, presumably also perhaps to the, the response state. You can get sometimes for some of the transport there. There's a similar model to describe the temperature dependence of the thermal balance. You have the same idea, right? You have some activation. Well, yeah. So I mean. Right, so uh, we've not done a fit over the sort of full temperature range uh, using, using this model. So we, we could, subsequently, we're just focused on the low temperature. And, uh, that's, that's, yeah. Okay, um, but this is good. So, so because, this, in fact, this is the point where I was going to stop, and now we're going to talk about the ion damage uh, stuff now. So, uh, so I'd be happy to entertain more questions here. Yeah. So I see there's a maximum in the lower sex. I've never seen that in any other bulk measurement. Yeah. Point where that's going. Yeah. Right. So, so the origin is is a good question. It, it did exist also uh, in some of the Michigan data. Yeah, we have yeah, seen so um, many samples. So, it, uh, so it shoots very slightly goes down, and then around uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. There's a small correction up, so there there are features, not always the same, but 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 when you zoom in, there uh, we've seen features like that. But I okay, we've never seen that before. So is that I I was familiar with that being in your sort of non-local contact. No, no, in the cup, in the cup, you know, we, we, some some samples uh, sort of uh, rather flat, some of them dip down a bit. At low temperatures, it always goes up, but, but we've seen small features like that. Okay. Okay. So, question. Yeah. Uh, did you see the hysteresis, the dual for hysteresis in the performance? Hysteresis, I don't recall specifically on this measurement whether or not uh, we have, so, but no, so we've never seen any hysteresis. Part of question. Discussion time, right? Your mobility <laughs> seems to be order magnitude smaller than other metals. So if you put in, if you pump that up by factor of 10, how do you change numbers? The mobility. Yeah. Um, so, right. So, well, so, so changing the mobility uh, won't actually, uh, sort of, I don't think, will dramatically uh, influence. <coughs> Take that back. No, I, so so I think we'd have to rethink it. The, the mobility is significantly different. So since since the from the NERNS data, we're dividing out the mobility. Yeah, so uh, yeah. yeah. So so uh, kind of a related experimental detail. I wonder what sort of contact geometry did you have when you're measuring these samples? Uh, right. So so it's just sort of four point measurements. Uh, sort of. And then also sort of adding, you know, sort of uh, just so we polish the sample sort of thin uh, and apply sort of four contacts uh, with sort of also a hull sort of on the, on the edges of the, of the sample. Uh, and these, yeah. Yes? Um, so, yes. I think in your paper it's zero one one. So, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But he's right. <laughs> that is true. So, okay, I think I better move on. Uh, um, okay, so we were uh, also interested uh, in the fact that uh, this, this evidence for, for surface conduction, uh, there, there are several papers, I just uh, showed one of the work. Uh, here from the AP group. Um, 
as well as this sort of evidence uh, for, the, for the fact that magnetic uh, impurities actually destroy the surface state, uh, we wondered if we could actually sort of have a sort of a, a probe that would actually sort of directly influence uh, just the surface state. Uh, and so what we ended up doing is uh, sort of an ion damage experiment. Uh, so when you put heavy ions into the sample, uh, then uh, they only penetrate a, a sort of relatively small depth uh, before then actually sort of colliding with the, another atom. Uh, and then so in fact in the work that I'll be showing here, uh, we talk about uh, DPA, uh, sort of how much DPA we have in the sample, and that's displacements per atom. So on average, how many times uh, an average uh, an atom at a particular sort of maximum peak uh, depth uh, sort of gets displaced. So one DPA means every atom uh, at a depth of 200 nanometers uh, was displaced once. Now whether it relaxes back or uh, not uh, still is, is, is an unknown uh, statement, um, but you can sort of certainly say that uh, you hit every atom uh, with a high energy uh, ion uh, once. And so here you can see sort of the, the energies uh, of the heavy atoms uh, that we put in. So we put four leads on the sample, uh, and then we, uh, we, we do our damage, uh, we, we make a measurement, uh, and then we, we repeat. Uh, so we, we put it back into the cell. Uh, the leads are never detached, uh, and so we sort of repeat this process. Um, so after we did the initial measurements, we actually went back uh, and wanted to look actually at, at very, very light damage samples. And so what you see here is the, the resistivity saturation uh, of the sort of normally pristine sample. Uh, and initially, as you damage the sample, in fact, you get an increase of the resistance. Sort of, this is kind of what you would expect, that as, if, even if you're not destroying the surface state, at least you would sort of reduce the mobility of the surface state, and so the resistance increases. But then what you see is actually something that we were sort of surprised about. This thing turns around uh, and actually starts dropping again. So the conductivity uh, is actually uh, already showing some improvement, uh, even at, at fairly light uh, amounts of damage. Uh, and then when we, we looked at this as a function of the, how deep the damage went in, so by using different uh, energy ions, uh, you could actually push the damage deeper and deeper into the sample, and the sample just became more and more conducting. Okay, so this already tells us that we, we have two channels uh, of conduction uh, during these ion damage experiments. Okay, um, and so here is now plotted in conductance as a function of the, the depth of damage. Uh, if, you know, the most naive expectation would be, you know, it's a topologically protected, nothing should happen. Uh, if there's some sort of reduction in the mobility, you would expect the, the conductance to go down. Um, if what you had done was actually just destroyed your surface state and then just created sort of an additional conducting channel uh, with this, you would expect actually the conductance at, at high temperatures to then extrapolate uh, to zero. Uh, and you see that clearly doesn't happen. In fact, we have to interpret this in terms of two conducting channels, uh, and in fact that the, the first one survives. So, so the picture that we have is that actually we had a surface state, if it's an intrinsic surface state, it reconstructs below the damage layer, and the damage layer is conducting. So this amorphous layer of heavily damaged uh, SMB6 is actually conducting. And when you fit this to sort of this two-channel uh, two model, what you see is that the conductance of your damage layer is of order two million ohm centimeters, uh, and still we retain uh, the, the surface state uh, uh, conductance. And this is actually consistent uh, with the neutron radiation studies uh, where now they can actually go to 10 dPa. Uh, so again, sort of heavily damage the, the material. Neutrons penetrate through the bulk of the sample. So in fact, uh, the entire sample now uh, is sort of amorphized, if, if this is the uh, correct language. Uh, and you can see that the resistivity here now drops to something about uh, one half million centimeters. So pretty much exactly what we infer uh, from our two channel fit. Uh, so, so we're quite confident that sort of uh, this heavily damaged SMB6 is actually conducting uh, material. Um, then we wanted to look what happens uh, with magnetic ion damage. Uh, and so in fact you can uh, use magnetic ions uh, 
Uh, and uh, what you see is basically exactly the same behavior. So we thought that at least the magnetic ions would actually destroy this topologically protected surface state, uh, even if it's reconstructed below, because at least there would be some magnetic scattering. Uh, and so from the, the work that was done uh, with, uh, with gadolinium ions, we expected an increase in resistance. Here again, we saw the decrease in resistance. Uh, it looks basically exactly the same as with the non-magnetic ions. Uh, and so uh, the, the conclusion is perhaps that again, uh, this intrinsic surface state is still reconstructing below even where the magnetic ions uh, end up stopping uh, in fractions. Okay, so what are the, the possible implications of this? Um, if you actually have this conducting layer on the surface, uh, you'd actually be interested in how well that co couples to a topological surface state. Um, if the coupling is strong, you'd actually uh, expect that you'd actually remove the, the topological surface state. So in fact, the fact that we actually still see the state uh, suggests that actually uh, the state is weakly coupled uh, and in some sense, that makes sense. So if you have an amorphous conductor, uh, the wave functions uh, could be quite localized. Uh, and as a result, you may not expect actually much overlap uh, with your intrinsic topological state. Uh, and so, so we think that this might be so the explanation for why we're actually able to still see the topological states, uh, even uh, though we have sort of an amorphous conducting layer on top. Um, the other thing is, this indicates that if you do a surface uh, probe type measurement, um, you don't necessarily have to see the intrinsic state. You might actually be seeing uh, some sort of amorphous state or uh, something else on the surface of the material. The actual topological state uh, may be living below the surface uh, of your material. Uh, and finally, uh, in our analysis, we assumed that the mobility of the surface state was unchanged. Uh, and this is significant from the viewpoint that if you, if you thought somehow that the, uh, the, the effective mass was determined because you had a smaller Tondo scale uh, on the surface of the material because uh, the, the coordination was different, if it's now reconstructing below, certainly the coordination is different. Uh, and so the fact that the mobility doesn't change uh, is we sort of kind of rule out those types of arguments. Okay. Um, how much time do I have left now? Well, you're in, uh, I'm in discussion already. Discussion. We already had five okay. minutes. So maybe, yeah. okay, so I'll, let me try and go, go a bit quicker. Um, I'll, I'll maybe skip this since there's sort of not much to say. We, we are trying to sort of deposit some aluminum and, and look at the, the coupling between superconductivity uh, and the topological surface state. Uh, this slide really says that we actually haven't sort of found anything particularly interesting uh, yet, but uh, if it is supposed to be a topological surface state, uh, this would be sort of a, a route to try and look for topological superconductivity. Um, I, I'd like to comment about the ability for us to predict strongly correlated topological insulators. Uh, and so, uh, you know, virtually every theoretical method uh, says that Samarium hexaboride is a topological insulator. Uh, and I think, uh, as we've already heard, uh, you know, viewpoints range from it's doubtful to it's almost certainly a topological insulator, uh, and hopefully we'll sort of resolve this issue uh, while we're here. But there are also, in addition, other materials that have been claimed uh, to be strongly correlated topological insulators. Uh, and in general, uh, there is actually very weak evidence uh, that we have found any other strongly correlated topological insulators. I think we'll hear a little later about some iron oxide. Uh, in the half oislers, there's some evidence from transport as well as ARPES that there is a metallic surface state, um, but the topological nature is still in question. Uh, we haven't done a lot of work at uh, Los Alamos and Plutonium Telluride, but uh, we have not also found any evidence for a topological surface state uh, in the few uh, cleaves that we've done in the photo mission there. Um, so why is this the case? Does this reflect the fact that uh, theory is lacking? Um, or actually that experiments is lacking. Uh, and I think something that's not discussed very often is that because, uh, in fact, if they're correlated topological insulators, uh, the, the kinetic energy uh, could be much smaller, and so they could actually be prone to instability. Uh, and so what are actually the right experimental probes to be looking at states uh, if the surface states themselves can be sensitive uh, to instabilities? Uh, and I, I think uh, that's a discussion 
uh, that I would like to learn more about uh, during this conference. Okay. Yes. You didn't mention Samaritan Sulfide. Samaritan Sulfide. Yes. So, Samaritan oh, Sulfide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so this was something that uh, sort of uh, we were wondering about because this is also a, a sort of uh, another condo insulator uh, type material. Um, but it doesn't show any evidence for resistivity saturation. Uh, you can see here from the angle of result photo emission data, uh, we don't have any evidence for any sort of uh, nice uh, topological uh, surface state. In fact, we don't see any evidence for even the Samarium D band inversion that you might kind of. Is that the pressure? What is that? Oh, the black state. Black state. What? This is, this is black, black or gold? gold? This is in the black face. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one was ever saying it might be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just taking a, a stupid viewpoint long ago that sort of, let's just see if we can even understand this, right? So, so I agree. So the, the gold phase is the sort of more interesting one. So, so this, this, uh, how sorry. big is the gap? That this was not meant to be a complete list by any means. Okay. How, okay. how big is the gap that you measure in the black phase of Um, from a car perspective. Well, so, so I don't know if I would necessarily sort of uh, take this sort of you know, 300 millivolts here as, as a big gap, but uh, from transport uh, and maybe Finger you know, can uh, remind me what the, what the value was, but I think uh, you get something like 90 millivolts or something like this from, from the transport, uh, but I would have to double check on that. I, I think the old optics have it at, you know, tenths of EV, Sure, um, big in the context of our current discussion. I don't remember exactly, but there's optics from, in the literature. Half a volt, some, some number like that. Um, so, so I, I think for me there's an interesting question whether sort of the, this work of the LDA plus DMFT shows the Samarium D band here, which does not get uh, inverted. This is still in, in the black phase. And the LDA plus U is able to sort of correctly reproduce that. But whether this is true in general, uh, to me, is still an open question. Uh, whether this sort of topological identification uh, can be robust just from the LDA plus, plus U calculation. Um, OK. Um, so uh, the chairman will cut me off uh, when he deems is, is appropriate, uh, but otherwise I'll speak for about five minutes on, on niobium arsenide. Four minutes. <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so niobium arsenide is one of these inversion symmetry breaking wild semi-metals. Uh, so what's interesting is that sort of uh, it has uh, this picture that it has both a sort of trivial kind of uh, semi-metal character as well as that due to the wild nose. Uh, this is the same as in the niobium phosphide. Uh, if you do uh, electronic structure calculations, uh, we get identical uh, calculation as in the niobium phosphide. This is basically because the states at the Fermi level are dominated by the niobium character uh, in this material. Uh, and in fact, uh, even though my Fermi surface rendering looks absolutely abysmal, uh, you see exactly the same pockets that you do in the, uh, the phosphide compound. Um, where here, uh, the wild nodes are uh, shown to be located, uh, associated with these electron pockets. Uh, it's the whole pockets that are trivial. Okay, so here's the uh, electrical transport data, um, resistivity hall data. Uh, you have a huge magneto resistance, so in terms of percent, 400,000 uh, percent at 18 tesla, uh, indicative of the very high mobility of these samples, uh, as well as you see uh, a huge number of quantum oscillations. If you do an FFT of this, you actually resolve two different frequencies. So one at 21 Tesla, another at 16 Tesla. Uh, and then you also, in fact, have a huge amount of higher harmonic content, which is actually a little bit anomalous. Um, but in fact, from a mass analysis, we know actually that this is a correct assignment. These are not new frequencies. These are harmonic components uh, of these other pockets. Um, we assign the beta pocket as the electron pocket, both in the LDA. The LDA calculation says that the electron pocket is the smaller pocket. Uh, as well as from the Hall data, you can see that the Hall data uh, is dominated uh, by an electron contribution. Uh, if it's a compensated metal, uh, this will be determined by which has the higher mobility. Uh, and the, so uh, we're actually sort of identifying this as the electron contribution. 
Um, importantly, uh, and this is sort of the, the main point, uh, because of this higher harmonic content, uh, the second derivative of the resistivity gives you very sharp peaks, and you can index all the individual Landau levels of both frequencies um, in this material. And so in the plot of uh, inverse magnetic field, uh, and so you can make these uh, Landau band plots where you, you parameterize the, the Landau level crossing as a function of 1 over V. The intercept tells you something about whether or not the material is topological, whether that particular orbit is topological. Uh, and so if it's trivial, you expect an intercept of half integer. If it's non-trivial, you expect the integer uh, intercept. Uh, and so what we find is actually that the alpha pocket has an intercept closer to a half, the beta pocket uh, closer to zero, actually within the limits of this sort of uh, uh, additional phase factor uh, that you can get uh, in sort of a 3D material. Uh, and so uh, we've assigned the beta pocket as, as electron light. Certainly we find that uh, evidence that it's non-trivial. Uh, the other thing is because of the very small orbits uh, that you get, you can actually easily get to the, the quantum limits uh, in this material. Um, We've done a mass analysis of these two things. Uh, so this is also further consistent. The alpha pocket is the heavier pocket. Uh, that would be consistent with it being uh, the um, our, uh, smaller mobility uh, orbit and the angle temperature. Uh, I'll skip the fermiology, uh, the parameters. So in addition to identifying it as topological uh, on the beta pocket, uh, from the dingle temperature, we can actually extract out uh, what the, the quantum uh, sort of lifetime is. You can see that that's orders of magnitude uh, larger for the transport lifetime, uh, perhaps consistent uh, with the inability to backscatter the electron uh, on this beta pocket. Okay, so with that, I will conclude. Uh, the conclusions are identical to the uh, outline uh, because, in fact, uh, what I've said is that we have a heavy surface state. Uh, we've looked at the ion damage, which we can uh, interpret in terms of reconstructing. Uh, and then finally, uh, I just finished with an I.O. and R tonight, uh, showing one that's topological, one that's trivial. With that, I'll thank you for your attention. Well, questions, or where they all ask you to talk? <laughs> Any questions? Uh, very nice talk. So regarding Sumerian hexafluoride, yeah. I'm wondering if you did any specific heat measurements of the ion damage. So not of the ion damage. One. So the, the question was, did we do specific heat measurements on the ion damage crystals? So so the ion damage crystals then, so the amount of volume fraction uh, from the ion damage is, is relatively small. Um, right, but so. if it's a surface born gamma, Right, so so already what we did with some Aramex chloride was we just measured a single crystal, then we just powdered it up, put it through a sieve, uh, and so we had particle sizes sort of that were sort of smaller than uh, 20 microns. Uh, and then, you know, so you didn't want to pack that back into a, a pellet, uh, and so actually we had to sort of, um, what we used was a heat varnish, uh, and then at that point now you have to start modeling your heat capacity data in terms of contribution to heat varnish, uh, a surface state which is somehow uh, different from the additional bulk contribution. Um, there were some hints that you could actually see a very small amount uh, of some surface contribution, um, but because of this thermal decoupling issue, uh, we could never actually sort of confirm uh, that we are actually able to, to see this. So, so I'm skeptical that we could take now our ion damage sample and see an additional sort of small contribution or lack thereof from this, so, but that would be nice. It maybe it's better to do it on a neutron and wait to be sample. Yeah. yeah uh, the Elon Newton uh, arsenic uh, experiment. Yes. Uh, and the rich, the last one. Yes. Uh, in which direction of pyro magnetic field? Uh, the direction is applied along the C axis. C axis. Yes. So in, uh, in that planet, we have uh, quantum star calculation. So probably we have uh, transfer. So we we do have some evidence for a smaller frequency pocket, uh, sort of below 10 tesla, 
but it starts getting difficult to resolve whether or not, you know, is this noise or, or an intrinsic feature, but it, I mean, there's, there's maybe some evidence for that, uh, so, but that's, that's not entirely clear. I'm not sure if that would be the orbit that you'd be referring to, so it would be maybe the problem. That one probably is extremely small. It was uh, but already in smaller images, and it's just as possible. I see. Uh, so, so it's possible. Um, so, but yeah, maybe we should we should discuss some more. Other colors. I just to point out that the different kinds of radiation might be quite interesting, and the paper is. Okay, so so right, so we're, this is a very interesting observation. Uh, I mean, we're just noting that sort of in our analysis, we're getting a similar conductivity uh, for our sort of amorphous, the, what we consider an amorphous damaged layer of the Samaritan Hexaboride. Um, so, but yeah, whether they're actually the same or not, uh, that's that's fair. Could you show the all data for SMB6 again? Yeah. yeah. So, to my knowledge, everyone, in quotation marks, I guess, has seen a positive Hall coefficient above, I don't know, some crossing temperature like 150K or some number yes. like that. And you seem to say that it, that didn't happen here. Well, no, so I mean, obviously, so this data is only about the cuts off the 50 Kelvin. Uh, so, so I could yeah, ask. So, at 100, yeah, at 50, so, but it might not have. It certainly, would, it be in the thermal power, also, is sort of changing sign at sort of around 190 Kelvin, I believe. Uh, so, and that's on this sample. So, uh, so. And then just to continue. Yeah. So then I notice you have the little the little blip, uh, so it comes down and then it tries to go positive, tries to go up again and then it goes down. That's right. So in the, the Nickerson data from long long time ago, actually you may remember uh, starts out positive, crosses, uh, turns negative, but doesn't go very large negative, uh -huh. and then it actually turns and comes back up positive again at the lowest temperature. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I always thought that had something to do with them having thin film samples because that's why we undertook to, to make measurements on Zach's samples uh, of the Hall effect and then we found that in those samples uh, it simply crossed over and went and went monotonically uh, down to some to some large number and then finally saturated. Right. So this funny little blip here is again the first time in many years that I have seen such a feature. Uh -huh. So I'm just surprised, and I, I remark on that. I, I, I think that the last time I saw that was in the Nickerson data, you know, in the early 80s. Or sorry, the early 70s. Cooley has that feature so in the whole effect. Really? Oh, yeah, of course. That little thing? I mean, it's quite the, let me see. I'll, I'll show the data in a second. OK, fine. So all the data that's I mean, positive in the temperature, too, right? I mean, it's, I've seen different. Curves. Is there not a problem with the fact that the connectivity is surface dominated low temperature such that depending on where you put your hall contacts, you might be measuring the wrong voltage? I mean, this is an issue. Right? Well, so I think, right, so the, there could be some <coughs> issue as far as what the, the actual current path is, right. right? So, but I think these are sort of factors to kinds of uh, issues, right? So uh, I don't think it's going to be. Yeah. Well, uh, regarding the surface effect, yes. So the uh, the inference of the stability came from the very low temperature point of the spectrum. Um, the you nerd you extracted certain parameters from the nerd right. Spectrum. Were you using just a low temperature? Limit? Yes. So. Right, 
so yeah, that, that's right. So we we have the mobility here um, just from the electrical conductivity, yeah. right? And then so dividing the the, the nerves by the mobility. Yeah. So, so it, 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 it's 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 just these sort of yeah two data points. So here. So. So I'm not as confident here as I am from from this data. But you know, if no, you yeah, pass, four points. Four points. There, okay, I'm being corrected. There are four points that are apparently not. Yeah. Okay. So the effective mass is uh, derived from that minced uh, slope. Um, no, I would say the the effective mass uh, is reliant on the Fermi energy. Uh, which can be inferred either from this slope if you assume some kind of scattering rate, uh, which is consistent with this slope that you would also infer if you assume the scattering rate. And then if you couple that uh, with a Fermi volume, right? So, so whether you take the RKF value, um, right? So if you take the RKF value, which is, is rather large, in fact, you get a humongous effect uh, if you take a KF value, uh, which you would infer uh, from sort of other work. So with alpha uh, within 4% minus 1, when you put it into the upper equation for thermal power, yes. uh, can you get the translation almost to zero? Right? You just literally take the yeah. This, right. yes. And you stick it back to that equation. Very eager, but right. very close to zero. Yes. Okay. Right. So, so, so it doesn't cancel as much. Um, okay. Oh yeah. You can pass more. Well, I think we are about to close the discussion time, and then we'll go to the discussion. Well, it's going to be confusing.